Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation part one of two on the cell structure. As we get going I want you to keep in mind that we are looking at a eukaryotic cell and kind of a, a typical eukaryotic cell at that or a model cell. So we're going to be stepping through all of the different organelles and characteristics for a, a typical type of cell. We're not going to be touching on the specifics for prokaryotic cells today. So the first element or component of our cell to point out is the cell membrane. And a cell membrane is going to be a semi-permeable membrane that encloses the cytoplasm as well as all the organelles of the actual cell. By semi-permeable, it means that there are small openings by which small substances can pass through. If we take a close look at the cell membrane, we see something called a phospholipid bilayer. By phospholipids, I mean that it has a substance that has a hydrophilic head to it, as well as hydrophobic tails. So these little tails are designed to kind of repel polar ions, and these little heads are designed to, well, they're called water loving, so they're going to attract water and other substances. Now, substances still can, small substances like oxygen, that's relatively nonpolar, can move through this membrane. But substances such um, that, that need a little bit of energy or perhaps need some facilitation need to go through things like channel proteins. So you find these proteins that are embedded throughout the membrane to help move substances through the uh, cell, into the cell. Another important thing to note with cell membrane is the fact that we have something called surface to volume ratio and this really is going to restrict the size of this cell. It's the reason why we find cells in this format where they're kind of small and lined up together kind of functioning cohesively as opposed to having really really big cells. When you have a really large cell you have the same volume as all these small cells but you have less surface area or less area for um, required substances to move across and into the cell. I like to think of it kind of as a cooking steak. If you've got a flat iron steak versus a, uh, um, <laughs> a petite filet mignon, your petite filet mignon is going to take longer to become well done than the flat iron because it's thicker. And it takes longer for the heat to get into the middle. So because of that, cells don't get too big because the Otherwise, if they did, there wouldn't be enough oxygen and other materials getting through to the cell in order to allow them to function efficiently. So that's why cells remain small. So with a cell wall, we do find this in eukaryotic cells. We also find it in prokaryotic cells. Um, but with the cell wall, we only find it in some organisms, some eukaryotic organisms, such as plant cells. This here is an example of a plant cell. And it's important to note that the cell wall is actually found on the exterior of the cell membrane. So it doesn't replace the cell membrane, it's in addition to that in some cells. The nucleus is our next organelle. And as many of you probably know, this is going to be a large organelle that contains genetic material or DNA. Uh, that DNA is going to be organized into something called chromosomes upon replication and also has uh, something called histone proteins that help to give it structure. It's important to know that the nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle, which means that it has its own special little membrane to it that kind of separates it, uh, gives it a little bit more, I guess, definition as well as rigidity with respect to what can travel inside and outside of it. If we take a look at this electron microscopic view of the nucleus, we can actually see that um, that nuclear envelope is going to be made up of two phospholipid membranes as well. So it's very, very similar to the structure of the actual cell membrane um, in that it has not only these little proteins kind of uh, surrounding it, but it also has this phospholipid bilayer to keep out material that is not necessarily required or necessary. 
ribosomes. And these are going to be very important yet small organelles. Ribosomes are found in what we call the cytosol or cytoplasm, or they can be found attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and that nuclear envelope we just pointed out. The role of this organelle is to create proteins. They go through a process called translation, tra translation that is able to piece together those proteins. And that's based on another process called transcription, which is um, basically controlled by RNA. So they are the assembly house, the, the kitchen, where all these proteins are being made. Now, if we take a close look at uh, endoplasmic reticulum, I said that there are ribosomes that are found kind of free-floating in the cytoplasm, but we also find them attached to the outside, and that's because this endoplasm of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's because it's going to be responsible for creating proteins, amongst other things. Now, taking a look at this, what we call smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, in smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it consists of a tubular form that does not have the ribosomes attached to the outside. The function is going to be specifically for lipid synth synthesis, for the creation of carbohydrates, to aid in metabolism, and to help with drug detoxification. So this drug detoxification is a really important component of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Also, it's going to be a repository for calcium ions, and that's going to be very useful for the cell to be able to control contractions. If we take a look at that uh, figure in an electron microscope, as well as um, in this kind of graphic figure, we see that the form of it is quite different from the sheet-like rough endoplasmic reticulum. So in rough endoplasmic reticulum, we find a slightly different function as well as structure. This is going to contain those ribosomes along the outer surface, which is why they call it rough. And essentially it's going to be responsible for creating or synthesizing and packaging secretory proteins. So um, for instance, if we were to look at a type of protein called insulin, which is produced in the pancreas, um, these cells are going to be really important for being able to, to help kind of control uh, glucose metabolism. And so because of the fact that glucose metabolism is so important to, the, to an organism's living capabilities and function, their process is going to be, um, of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, is really important. So the creation of those specific proteins is, is pretty critical to bodily kind of functions. The other important thing to note about rough endoplasmic meticulum is that once those proteins are created, and as you can see, we've got that ribosome that's attached to the outside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it's producing proteins here represented by these little chains that are then kind of packaged and, and um, I guess modified slightly with a sugar chain. Those then will go into something called a, a vesicle, which is going to bud off from the end of the endoplasmic reticulum and kind of be transported to the next stage in the process. So what is the difference between structure and function in the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum? I'll let you just kind of think about that for a second. All right, hopefully you said something to the effect that there is different substances that are, are produced and also um, that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is more importantly used for um, drug detoxification, whereas protein creation and packaging is more important in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right, now looking at these vesicles, we actually have a couple different types and a couple different ways they're used. Essentially, all they are is a little membranous structure that helps to store as well as transport different substances. Um, some of these vesicles, and, and it's a broad term, so it can be used um, 
or, or applied to different situations. Some of them are going to be used in order to di digest certain substances. Um, and some of them are going to be used to carry proteins to the Golgi apparatus for processing, such as with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the Golgi apparatus is another kind of funky, cool um, organelle found in the cell. And essentially, it's found in most eukaryotic cells. And it's it has all these membranes that it and structure or tubes and structure that it uses in order to sort as well as kind of package proteins and other substances. It then kind of ships those off. It's like a FedEx, really. Sorts everything, ships it off to where its actual destination is in some of these vesicles. So if we take a look at that, we've got this Golgi apparatus that has a series of different I said tubes, but maybe channels or whatnot that the proteins go through. They start off as being received on this end of the Golgi apparatus. They get processed and packaged and maybe kind of paired with other items. And they are transported or shipped off at the other end of the Golgi apparatus to wherever they might need to go. That might be to the cell membrane so they can be exported outside of the cell or possibly to other, some other location within the cell. So if we take a look at this whole process, um, we've got our smooth endoplasmic reticulum, our rough endoplasmic reticulum creating these proteins, again, that get kind of shipped off by vesicle over to the Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus receives those vesicles and the membrane, or the proteins in them. Using its structure, it kind of sorts those proteins and then ships them off to wherever it needs to go on the, on the back end. Another really important couple of organelles here are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. And I've lumped them together because of the fact that they are responsible for energy kind of production and processing. A mitochondria is going to be an organelle in the cytoplasm that is going to create energy. It produces something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the form of energy source that's used for all cellular work. Our mitochondria are going to be very special organelles because of the fact that they have their very own DNA found within the organelle. They also have ribosomes and other enzymes that are present within the inside of the organelle in order to maintain its operation of ATP production. Um, we have these kind of, um, I guess, folds within the mitochondria, which are called crista. And there's a, a quite a bit more, I guess, substance to these organelles as opposed to some others, as they have an inner and an outer membrane. Chloroplasts are going to be the photosynthesizing organelle found in plants and algae, some other protists. Um, and these chloroplasts will go over more through our, our presentation on photosynthesis, but essentially they're going to take light energy and transform that into... Um, glucose. The glucose then is taken by the mitochondria and turned into ATP. So they kind of work together. We also find something called a lysosome. And a lysosome is really important for kind of cleaning up. Essentially, these are going to be referred to as the recycling centers of the organelle or um, of the cell. And this organelle is going to digest as well as remove any kind of damaged organelles that might be present in the cell. It's going to look like a little vesicle, but essentially it's a sac that has digestive enzymes in it, and those digestive enzymes are going to be used to break things down. So it's really important for being able to kind of deal with dead and decaying material. If we take a look at our um, a good example of a lysosome, is sometimes we'll have food vacuoles that will obtain food from the outside of the cell. The lysosome will pair up or meet up with that food vacuole and it will import its, its little enzymes into the actual kind of conglomerate there and help break down that food. So it's, it's really the cell's way of being able to digest things. And we find something called a vacuole 
which is going to be a large vesicle that has various functions. One of them is, is digestion uh, in plants. Another one is going to be removing excess water. Uh, we find this in plants as well. It's going to be really important for helping the cell to, or helping the plants to be able to manage water by absorbing it. If we take a look at this example of a, of a plant cell, I believe we've got our central vacuole, which is located here in this white space. And as you can see, it's quite large because it's holding or storing so much water. The plants are really good at dealing with large quantities of water. Um, in some other types of cells, like animal cells, they can't really manage too much water, but our plants are used to being able to store water for later. So you see that in comparison to the other organelles, it can get quite big. So how is a vacuole different from a vesicle? What do you think about that? If you said that a va vesicle is just used for transporting things from one area to another, and a vacuole is used for more, more for food or water storage, then you would be correct. All right, and that gives us a brief tour of the organelles found within the cell.